address something? Okay, thank you very much. No, 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 I just want to address it. Okay, so it's my... So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to the uh, second invited talk of the conference. Um, so, uh, so the speaker today is George Pappas from University of Pennsylvania. He's the uh, Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, right? As well as a member of the Electrical and Systems Department. Each of these have slightly different names. And then it has additional affiliations both with uh, information sciences and then mechanical engineering. Um, which is kind of an amazing diversity uh, background. He's also an IEEE fellow. Um, he's a member on the research side of the GRASP lab. Um, and uh, George is kind of very well known as a control theorist who has worked on a very broad set of systems, including uh, embedded systems, discrete event systems, hybrid systems, and hierarchical systems, um, with applications to a very broad set of areas, including robotics, distributed robotics, autonomous, um, air vehicles, uh, green buildings, and, and um, I guess molecular genetic networks, which are also areas that are very fond to my, my heart as well. Um, George comes from the hybrid systems community, right? And the hybrid systems community kind of evolved from um, first by computer scientists and control theorists coming together because both are trying to prove properties of a system, right? Um, and so as the world increasingly moved to both mixed discrete and continuous systems to be able to validate their properties, you wanted to be able to draw from both control theory and, and from formal methods. Through that evolution, that those communities and the control community in particular has absorbed many of the tech formal models that are used within, within the formal methods community, just as we've seen also within the planning community. And we've seen an evolution from first verification of hybrid systems to controller synthesis and towards planning. So you'll see a very nice synergy between the kind of research that we do here and what George does in his community, but much more from a control theoretic uh, perspective. So I'm very excited to see these methods. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, well. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I also have to thank the people that really did the work. Um, so my, uh, f especially my former uh, group members, uh, Hadas Kres Gazit, who is now at Cornell, and uh, Jorgis Fenekos, who is at Arizona State, and now some of my existing students that are, uh, current students that are sort of following up. Of course, uh, uh, sponsors, uh, we have to really, I really have to thank the National Science Foundation, they really support it, bringing communities together, and I think that has been a, a very strong point. And uh, very recently, last month, the NSF awarded us a very large expeditions award, uh, very much focusing on this transformation from uh, sort of verification towards synthesis of embedded software with a, sort of a, a direction towards robotics, uh, in, including really a great set of people. So to motivate a little bit the, the problems that I, we're going to talk about, I want to get a little bit the bigger uh, landscape of what you would see inside some kind of a, a, a sort of a, a team of UAVs. And if you zoom inside the architecture, you would find three, at least three layers. But let me just stick to three layers for today. Uh, so I am indeed a control theorist. I tend to stay at this level which is the MATLAB level. That's where you design your controllers, your Kalman filters, and so on. Okay, and you prove nice properties about stability and all of those things that, that we teach undergraduates to do. Uh, then there is a la layer below, and that is the real-time systems embedded. Uh, those are microprocessors that interface with actuators, things that really get the job done at the low level, and you have to deal with real-time operating systems and so, uh, so one issue that needs to be understood, and, uh, and it's uh, becoming more and more of an issue, is uh, how to map these controllers on uh, such platforms. And as platforms get more and more expensive, for example, in a BMW, you have like 75 of these uh, microprocessors, how to map many of these controllers to the same type of real-time resources. So that's one big challenge that, that is, uh, that's happening right now. Uh, and so this is a case where computation interacts with control, but it's essentially computation is really supposed to really uh, implement the control uh, functionality. 
And then there is the layer above, and this is where uh, I, I believe many of you, uh, a lot of your algorithms live, where uh, you want to do some kind of supervision of all these controllers. So for example, I have all the logic that says if you see an obstacle, do this, or if you see another aircraft within five uh, you know, kilometers, do that, and so on. So here you have a layer of software that's doing a lot of the higher level planning, reasoning, and so on, and that in some sense uh, supervises uh, a lot of these controller layers below. So you have a library of controllers, and then you have higher level reasoning that's supposed to see really uh, sort of manage this, this uh, set of controllers and so on. So it's, this is a different interaction between computing and control. And in this case, control is the really there to serve the needs of the software, or if in your case, the planner. And uh, th this interaction is, is quite different from this interaction. So I, I come from the hybrid systems community. We tend to say computation control and put it into one big soup. But I think there are quite different uh, beasts here. This is a more event-based interaction between computation and control, and this is more, much more a fast timing, tight control loop type of interaction, and different approaches really apply to these different levels of the hierarchy. Now, if you go to a more concrete, uh, there were, of course, there was the urban challenge a few years ago, uh, and a similar type of architecture existed in more or less lots of the cars, that uh, vehicles that participated. Uh, so people designed controllers with trajectories, uh, planners, and trajectory controllers, and all of that. And then, uh, now what DARPA gave to the teams was two files. One file was, here's basically the sequence waypoints, here's the environment, uh, and these are all the checkpoints and so on. So that was a description of the environment they were supposed to drive. And then there was the mission description file which was, this is the mission that you as a car have to accomplish, which is you have to follow the sequence of waypoints, go there, park, avoid all, all uh, cars, and so on. Then the question is how to really construct all these layers of the hierarchy, do the testing, and so on. Okay, so this is, a, we'll come back to this example a little bit uh, later. So, so if you wanna abstract a little bit uh, and, and just stick to these three layers that I just introduced, then the way I look at this is that at the middle layer, I see control systems, Kalman filters, the kind of things that we do in the control systems community. Then at this level above, you see the planning, a lot of the great work that uh, you folks are doing here. And uh, there's also other related communities like the formal methods community and the discrete event community and so on. And here is where you do a, a lot of, sort of uh, event-based uh, interaction planning and so on. And then there's a, a different community here which is the real-time systems community. We're talking about real-time operating systems, the better systems and so on. Now the, 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 the purpose really of the, of, the, of the talk is not so much to um, speak about any layer in particular. I'm not gonna talk about the, the, the bottom layer at all. Uh, but really, I think the, the challenge is really in the interfaces across the layers. Okay, so I think my, my, even though I'm a control theorist, I don't really work in control. I don't design controllers unless there's a need. I really focus very much on how control interfaces with the layer above and the layer below. Okay, that's where I see as a control theorist a lot of the challenges going forward. So, of course, there has been a lot of great work uh, at, at all levels. Uh, in particular, uh, in the planning community, uh, the work of uh, Paolo Traverso and his collaborators on sort of planning using model checking is something that has really influenced us and, and, and credit goes to this community for sort of pursuing that. Of course, there are, um, there's approaches on the control side of how to address these things, and I'm just say, you know, putting a two or three here, but I could list thousands. Uh, but the point is, my, my, real, my point is again, is that a lot of the technical challenges I see is at the interface because the things that you prove at the planning layer may or may not transition into what will happen at the real time at better computing layer at all. Okay? And the things that we design at the control layer may or may not transition uh, into sort of a, a safe, efficient uh, sort of execution at the layer below. So the, the, the question then is really how to have these communities talk to each other so that we can sort of integrate better planning, control, and computing. And that would, if, you know, as being a hybrid systems uh, person, I really believe that 
that hybrid systems, uh, the idea of having a more systems view, holistic view of the system, mixing the discrete and continuous systems uh, is, is one way of doing it. And another thing I'm going to make towards the end is that uh, we really need uh, these interfaces to be robust. And what I mean by that is that what you do here, if you say, I say, if you say to the urban challenge vehicle, you know, go to the next waypoint, it's not going to exactly do that. It's going to do something close to it. And the question is how should we change the way we think about planning and, and sort of like all of those things to accommodate for that type of uncertainty. So, so, so I think this is uh, something that will come later. So in the hybrid systems community, people have been looking on uh, sort of these mixture, uh, mixture uh, problems of how to mix discrete and continuous. These are uh, some representative uh, publications from some people. These are some of the closest work to what I will be presenting here. Uh, work of Emilio Frazzoli, Magnus Eggerstedt, Kalin Belta, Eric Lavins, and, and others, and, and, and uh, Antonio Bicchi. Of course, there's many other people. Brian also has, is doing a lot of great work in this area. So, so this is um, uh, just a sample of of uh, the, the, some of the uh, problems we're going to address, address. And here's, in particular, for today, in, I'm going to talk a little bit about the interaction between these two layers, which is how to do temporal logic planning, but for dynamic robots. Okay, not for a, a plan, uh, so, so there'll be dynamics here. And there's, of course, other issues of how to do dynamics over, say, time-triggered architectures, but that's a completely separate uh, talk. I'm not going to talk about that. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to mix, how to sort of interface these two layers and do temporal logic planning, the kind of things that, that you have been doing, but also incorporating the dynamics and so on. So how can we incorporate dynamics and so on? Okay, so to go, go into the technical part, so we will start by having a map of an environment. So this is my office floor. Okay, and a robot will appear and it will know where it, where it is. So in this talk, we will assume we know the environment. And, uh, then, and then somebody has to do some kind of a task. Okay, and the task may mean go to these encircled regions, avoid this corridor, you know, and make, perhaps search for somebody and so on. Okay. Now, um, in the robotics community, I know this is not true in the, in, the, in, the, in the planning community, in the robotics community, people talk about tasks and talk about tasks, but, but there's very few formalisms about how to really describe what a task is and what are the precise semantics and so on. Okay, so I know that's not true in the planning community, but it is certainly true in the robotics community. So the first thing you have to look at is how do you specify tasks and so on. So what we did is, something that has already been done in formal methods community, the planning community, and so on, is really look at temporal logics as a way of specifying tasks. Okay, so uh, you can, you don't have to stick to temporal logic or linear temporal logic, you can pick other ways, but the important thing, uh, uh, but the important thing is that it captures a variety of tasks that we want. So temporal logic is a formalism by which you can sort of express a variety of tasks. So obviously you want, the diamond stands for the word eventually. So you want to say things like eventually I would like to go to region P2, okay, to that room. You can express coverage requirements. So eventually you want to go to this room and eventually you want to go to that room and eventually you want to go to that room. So th you can express uh, those things. You can express uh, sequencing that you want to go to P2 before you go to P3. And of course the most uh, studied problem in robotics, which is go to P4, and until you go to P4, so you stand for until, until you go to P4, you should avoid P2 and P3. So go to somewhere and avoid obstacles, hundreds of papers on this every year in the robotics community. Now, it doesn't, you don't have to, if, if these were the problems we wanted to study, we wouldn't need temporal logics at all, okay? We can just specify this is the task, let's go solve it. The thing that we don't do that well in robotics is is how to make compositional tasks. How can we build, oops, sorry, that's an autopilot here. <laughs> sorry. So the, the thing we want to do is how do we build larger tasks out of smaller tasks and solutions of smaller tasks that we have already done. Okay, so if you have a more complicated uh, specification like visit the region P2, then P3, P4, whatever, then <coughs> return to P1, 
uh, while avoiding these regions, then you can stitch together, or you can write in this formalism, basically larger and larger and larger specifications. So the key thing is, you know, if you don't like number logic, that's absolutely fine. Pick whatever your formalism is. Make sure it has formal semantics one, and make sure it, it has compositional semantics two. So you can build larger plans out of smaller plans. And then the challenge is how do you map solutions of the smaller plans in order to solve the larger plan. Okay. So for today, we picked temporal logics because we were comfortable with it. This, I'm going to justify why we picked temporal logic, but I can see this going forward with lots of other formalisms. Okay, so syntax uh, uh, of uh, LTL is basically propositional logic where you can have disjunction and conjunctions, but you also have temporal operators, the key one being the, if, if you have discrete time semantics, it's the next. So in the next state, you will satisfy phi one, and you have the until operator, which means that you will eventually satisfy phi two, and until you satisfy phi two, you will uh, have to satisfy phi one. So this is basically, I want to eventually go to a room, and I want to avoid obstacles until I get there. So that's the until operator. And the semantics, which I will present just informally. So the idea for the semantics is that given a string, given execution, given a trajectory, uh, and a formula, you can decide whether that string satisfies the formula or not. Okay, so, so for example, if the formula is eventually I want to see P, eventually I want to go to room P, then an ex a valid uh, execution that satisfies this is, you know, whatever, 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 and eventually you see symbol P. That's, then this string satisfies this formula. If you want to say always P, the box stands for always, then you have to be seeing P forever. So you always want to be safe. So you have to be safe at each step of the execution. Then you can have uh, a little bit more elaborate that if you, you know, if it uh, rains tomorrow, then it will rain, to, if it rains today, maybe it will rain tomorrow as well. So things like that. And then of course the until operator semantics, which is that you satisfy P and then eventually you see Q. Okay, so this is what the semantics of LTL is, of, of linear temporal logic. I'm not gonna go through the formal semantics of it at all. <coughs> so, but then we wanted to use LDL to specify a simple robot plan. So for example, visit rooms one, two, three, while avoiding corridor one, and you can sort of write things like that. And then you can also introduce something we'll do later, some sensor symbols. So for example, if the light is on, then visit uh, rooms one and two uh, infinitely often, or if you see somebody beep and so on. Okay, so the first specification here doesn't have any sensing. It's basically do this, whereas here, based on what you detect, you may want to do Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about that later. <coughs> now, of course, there's a zoo of temporal logics. Okay, so we picked uh, LTL, which is this. Um, there's CTL, there's mu calculus, there's real-time versions of this, spatial versions of this. Again, uh, we picked LTL for a variety of reasons, but I, uh, you can general, and, and people have generalized a lot of these ideas to more general logics and so on. So with all of this uh, context, we, our problem now is uh, simple but very non-standard for a control person, which is given a dynamical model, design a controller so that when you compose the controller with a robot, you satisfy a temporal logic specification. Okay. Now, uh, the control people will complain today, and now for the next few slides, I'm going to assume the, 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 the dynamics are simple, they're fully actuated. And I'm going to tell you later how to get more complicated dynamics because no matter what dynamics you have, control people want more complicated dynamics. So they will always complain. So, so I'll, for now, I'm going to stay to this problem, stick to this problem, and then I'm going to tell you how even more complicated dynamics can be incorporated later. Okay, so we start with an, uh, a sort of a, a map of the environment. This is a, an assumption which I don't like, but it is. It's something that people should work on, on how to do these things in environments where you don't know the environment and you discover it and so on. But today you start with a, an environment and you will do some kind of a discrete abstraction. And the discrete abstraction could be done by triangulation uh, automatically and you can get the dual uh, graph of it where nodes are basically triangles and adjacent nodes there's, a, a, there's a, an edge next to them. <coughs> so you get a graph. Okay, so we will start with that. You have to make sure a little bit that the, these are the regions of interest, that these are the, re, the rooms that are labeled specifically in the formula. 
Okay, so, so then something that has been done already in the planning community is to do planning via model checking. Okay, so what is model checking? Model checking is the approach in the formal methods community where you get a graph, a transition system based model or a graph based model of your code and you have some initial conditions and then you verify that all executions of the code satisfy the form. Okay, so model checking basically is all executions, for all initial conditions, all executions will satisfy the formula. Okay, and there's lots of tools, algorithms of how to do that. Now the planning problem is in some sense the dual of it in the sense that you want to find a particular path in this graph that satisfies the temporal <coughs> logic specification. So you can convert the planning problem into a model checking problem by essentially doing the dual, which is that you're sort of saying, well, if I want to do an existential, if I want to find a particular path that satisfies P, I, all, all I need is one path, then I say that it's not the case that exists, uh, that, that all, all uh, trajectories satisfy not phi, and there, therefore a counterexample to this problem will actually be a witness for a solution for your planning problem. Okay, so you're converting basically your bug finder into a plan. Okay, now, um, there is lots of tools, very powerful tools. Again, I have to talk faster probably. So there's lots of tools, uh, SPIN and new SMV, and uh, we have used the new SMV uh, in the, because uh, symbolic approaches have, been, uh, have evolved a little bit more. Uh, but uh, but uh, there's also other types of uh, tools. And that's really one of the reasons we really use LPL is because there's, just, there's a wealth of tools out there or doing these type of things, okay? So you can do a lot of these things automated, so you can start with this, you can triangulate automatically, you can get new SMV code automatically, you can get, uh, you can write your specification that's translated automatically in new SMV format, you press the button and you get a plan, you model check this and you try to get then a plan that satisfies the specification and of course you will get a discrete plan. So at the end of the day, you will, you will <laughs> the, the model checker will say, there is a path that actually satisfies this and here's the sequence of triangles that will actually satisfy this. Of course, this is just a sequence of triangles, it's just a discrete path plan. We still don't know how to map that down to the continuous world. Let me hold on that question, I'll come back to it. Okay, so what are some of the pros and the cons uh, here? Obviously, and the reason we really use this is because there's great tools and you can really do it for powerful large systems, okay? and people keep on working on the tools and they're getting professional grade and so on. Now there's something that is, uh, you know, addressable perhaps is that the paths are not optimal, okay? So model checkers are not in the business of finding optimal bugs, they're in the business of finding bugs, okay? And the thing, the, the, the previous approach was essentially an open loop plan, right? I mean, this was, here's a trajectory that will meet the specification. It didn't, the robot didn't have to look into the environment to see whether there is something there. It didn't have to react to the environment at all. Okay, so there was no sensing at, at, involved with the environment. Even though we knew the environment, we assumed that we press the button, the thing is executed, and now. So the question then is now how do we react to changes to the environment? And that leads essentially to the next phase, which is, uh, what I want to talk is how to do sort of reactive planning, and this is the, the paper I'm going to uh, focus uh, on. So uh, in 2006, there was a great paper by Amir Pnueli and uh, Peterman, and, um, and they came up with a fragment of LTL, and this fragment has the following structure, and is known as general reactivity one, and the, the structure is that uh, you're looking at LTL formulas that have as eff effectively an implication. You want the robot to satisfy this specification as long as the environment satisfies some assumption. So you have propositions that have to do with the robot, and the, but also now you have propositions that have to do with the state of the environment. So you've, you're splitting the world in two parts, what the robot sees and what's happening out there. And now you're saying that I would like to guarantee this behavior assuming that, the, that I'm in an environment that satisfies this behavior, okay? Now, if you don't know anything about the environment, you can simply put the formula true, and that means that you have absolutely no knowledge of what's happening out there, 
and your planner has to plan for all possible contingencies of the environment. The more knowledge you have here about the environment, the more you're constraining the possible evolutions in the environment, and, if, and effectively you're helping the planner uh, in its search and, and, and so on. Okay? So, uh, so this is uh, the standard assumed guarantee type reasoning. You see in a formal verification community that you would like this component to satisfy a specification under assumptions on its inputs and so on. Okay? Now in the robotics world, uh, the assumptions could be in a multi-robot situation that I will do something under the assumptions that you will do something else and so on. So this could go in a lot of different ways. There's additional substructure in each of these formulas. Um, and if you look into the substructure, it looks something like this. We don't have to go through uh, this side, but effectively this is the formula on the environment. And there's the part that says how the environment is initialized what are the allowable transitions of the environment, and what are the allow allowable goal states of the environment. And similarly for the robot, how is the system initialized, what are the possible transitions of the system, and what are the desired goal states of the environment. And we cannot mix temporal operators as we wish. Okay, let me just stay, stick to that. There are some things in LTL that you cannot express here. So uh, just to give you a little bit of an example, uh, so if you have a, a search example that you're now trying to search for something, so you have to really sense uh, fish, Nemo, uh, and uh, you know a priori, so this is your assumption about the environment, that it may be in one, three, five, or eight. Okay, so these are your assumptions. If you don't know anything, then it could be anywhere. Okay, you make the search problem hard. Okay, so starting in corridor uh, 12, uh, look for, uh, for Nemo in these particular rooms, and if at some point you see him, stop, beep, and beep, and so on. Okay, so you have two, you split the world into robot propositions, as well as, in this case, one binary sensor, and the binary sensor tells you whether you saw Nemo or not. And people, of course, we have to work on getting the sensor, uh, you know, the sensor abstractions a little bit more sophisticated. So you can take this and map it into this formalism that I say. So here's the part that has to do with assumptions on the environment. And here's the part that has to do with assumptions on the robot. So initially, we do not see uh, Waldo in this case. Nemo, <laughs> so sorry, it should be Nemo or Waldo. And then here are the allowable mobility that you allow Nemo. So Nemo is not to move in this particular case. So if you are at a particular state, then you're there at the next state. Okay, and there's no particular goal state for, uh, for Nemo. Okay, so this is how you capture it here. And then th this is what you would like the robot to do. So you start at room 12, and eventually you want to visit all these rooms uh, or see Nemo. Okay, so that's how you press this. Okay, so this is the, the structure of the specification. Okay, now, so why this uh, general reactivity one substructure? <coughs> so the first view here is, which I didn't say explicitly, is that this is moving away from model checking and going towards synthesis. Okay, so model checking is somebody writes the code and then you pass it to the verifier to sort of check whether what I have written is okay or not. Synthesis is the dual a top-down view of the world where you write what you want and code is generated automatically that acts the specification. Okay, so this is a synthesis approach to the problem. If you like, this could be viewed as planning via synthesis, not as planning via model checking. So it's not that we wrote something up and then we have to do it. Okay, now algorithmically the important thing here is that if you want to do a synthesis on the full-blown LTL, then that would be double exponential in the length of the formula. So if you, for, so for f small plans, it could work, but as plans get larger and larger and larger, then it would, we would have complexity challenges. Whereas here, this is uh, better. It's still, it's polynomial in the number of states, but the states are exponential in the number of propositions. So it's more of a modeling challenge and less of a specification challenge. Okay, so that in, in, model, in model checking and formal verification, there's two dimensions of complexity. One is how big is the model, and the other one, how large is the specification. So this is a little bit more of a modeling complexity and less of a specification complexity. So from a specification point of view, this fragment is good. Now, uh, algorithmically, the way this is solved is basically it's a game. 
it's a game between the robot and the environment. Okay, so so you, you can think of it a, as a game on a graph where there are two players, there's the robot and there's the environment, they take alternating actions, and then you're, if no matter what the environment does, the robot wins, the, uh, the, and wins means that I can satisfy the specific temporal logic formula, then you extract essentially a winning strategy. And that strategy is basically your code, if you are in the formal verification community, or your planner, in, if you are uh, in the planning community. Okay, now, we are sticking to a fragment of the full-blown LDL, which means we cannot say everything in LDL, there's restrictions. So we cannot say, for example, eventually always fee. Okay, so diamond box fee. But we can say things like, uh, we can sort of approximate that by saying after C, for example, always fee happens and so on. Okay, and in, uh, from, a, from, a, from a sort of a conceptual point of view, I really find this explicit representation of assumptions of the environment into the planning process very appealing. Assumptions, I, th I believe, are always hidden and a lot of the bugs happen because assumptions are not clear. And this forces us to make the assumptions very clear and explicit when we design planners, controllers, and so on. Okay, so the algorithm, the game semantics algorithm, would take this, we would obviously write it in the temporal logic uh, specification, and then you would run the synthesis algorithm, and what you would get is something like this. You would get an automaton, a planner, and the, it starts at uh, room 12, and these are regions, the rooms, and you say go to room, room 9, room 1, room 9, and so on. And then if you are in room 1, since you know that you're in room 1, and uh, Nemo may be there, then you check for Nemo, and if Nemo is there, basically you beep. If not, then you keep on going, essentially. Okay, so this is, uh, this is automatically now done. Okay, so you can basically start here and then you move at room nine and you, then you move to room one and then you check for Nemo. Nemo was not in room one and then you go to room uh, three, which was where you, uh, you know, what your assumption here was and then you check for Nemo, Nemo was there. You go to the beep state and you're done with your task. Okay, now uh, sort of a limitation for this is is that if you're very explicit about the assumption is that the, this planner works really for the, that specified you know, assumption. So if, for example, Nemo was not in one, three, five, or eight, but it was in room nine, then this planner doesn't work. Okay. So if the assumptions, uh, since we have an implication, if the environment satisfies this, then the robot satisfies that. If the environment is false, no, all bets are off regarding what the robot will satisfy and then in the plan. Okay. So now uh, we have this reactive planner that sort of can look at what's happening in the environment and based on that make decisions about whether to go to this room or in that room. Now the question becomes, we have, if you like, a discrete controller, a discrete planner. The question is how can we map this now down to a physical, feasible, uh, how can we incorporate the dynamics? And this is where I have to put my hybrid uh, systems hat now. Okay, so there's a community of people uh, that have been focusing over the past uh, decade or 15 years on the following problem. They're given some kind of a dynamical system, linear, nonlinear, and whatever uh, class of systems, try to abstract it to some symbolic model, okay, and somehow show that these systems uh, are equivalent in some sense. And this initially was done with a view towards verification. Okay, so the initial viewpoint was I wanted to verify, for example, that X would never exceed five. Okay. And then I would try to get some kind of a discrete abstraction of it, show that somehow that uh, the dynamics of whether X is greater than five or not are captured by some complicated graph model and then plug this to a model checker and verify the system. Okay, that was the verification approach. But over the past, I would say, five years, especially with the work of Paolo, Tabuada, and so on, there is a synthesis viewpoint to this, which is a little bit uh, broader in the sense that we want to control the system to satisfy temporal logic specification. We get some kind of a abstraction which is let's say equivalent for today to the continuous system. You design your planner 
at, at, your, uh, at, at this level, at the discrete level, and then you have to have a map of how these plants need to be pulled back at the continuous world. Okay? So this is really excuse me, the interface between the continuous and the discrete. Uh, in my view, this is a great way by which a lot of the work that you guys do on the right side can be pulled to the left side by sort of talking to some of these people and, uh, and sort of reading some of these papers. So, so you have to be very careful now here what do you mean by equivalence. Okay? And uh, equivalence, you have to couple it to the specification. So if you are sticking with uh, LTL, then language equivalence is suffices to preserve LTL properties. So you have to show that the continuous system and this discrete abstraction basically generate the same sequences and the same trajectories. By simulation equivalence, which is stronger than uh, language equivalence, preserves not only at the LTL, it preserves lots of other things and so on. I'm not going to get into the specifics of how to define by simulation and all of those things, but in this talk, I'm just going to give you of how to address by simulation equivalence on just this particular problem of temporal logics for robots. What you really need effectively for by simulation equivalence when you discretize the continuum is something that like this. So you're in room nine and your discrete planner tells you go to room one, the adjacent room one. So that's your discrete action. Okay. Now, the planner has no idea about the status of the robot in the, in the room. The, the robot could be here pointing in the wrong direction. It could be here pointing in the right direction. It could be here, uh, you know, uh, with zero velocity and so on. Okay. So your high-level plan, it's not clear how to map that into a low-level specification. And, and, and just because you say go to it, you have no idea whether it will actually be executed. Because it, it could very well be that the robot gets... Uh, you know, comes here and says, sorry, I'm stuck, and so on. I cannot really do it. And, 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 and we're going to come back to that, actually. Okay, so what you really need, then, is given the dynamics of the system, which may be linear, nonlinear, fully actuated, unicycle, whatever your robot dynamics are, and given the cell, the, which comes from the partition that you've chosen and, or the triangulation or whatever, in each of these cells, you have to design a controller so that the, contro the, the continuous controller now, so that the closed loop system of the continuous controller and the dynamics, the closed loop vector field looks like this. Okay, so if the planner says go here, then regardless of where you are in this cell, regardless of where you are, if you are here, you will be pointing inward, if, and then if you're going to be here, you're going to be pointing outward. Okay, so. So you, this is the, in some sense, the, if you have a partition and you define the sort of the bisimilar quotient of a, of, a, of a system, this is the kind of property you want in order for the quotient to be a bisimulation, meaning that if one state can exit this way, then all states in the same equivalence class have to exit the same way. Okay? Let's make sure that high level, the high level can basically ignore the low level because the low level is taking care of the uncertainty that you have at the high level about low level details about where exactly am I in the room and so on. Okay? Now if you don't have this, then you have to potentially inform the planner about it's impossible and so on, to perhaps trim some of the edges of the, of the graph and so on. And then you can stitch these things. That's the good thing about these is that you can stitch these. So if the planner says go here and then from this cell goes there, then you put such a controller here, then you put such a controller there and so on. So this is basically what the control people need to design. And in that case, effectively, then the planner is effectively is telling you which continuous controllers to pull from your library and how to stitch them in order to actually satisfy the plan. So the planner is really orchestrating how to choose the controllers and how to execute them. Okay, so there's a variety of ways of con co constructing such controllers. So the first paper here by uh, Kalin Belta. Um, and Luke Hubbitz uh, does it for linear systems with linear affine controller f f designed on simplices, so you have triangles. This, this uh, you know, it's very much about how dynamics and, 
and sets uh, sort of line up. The challenge is really very much there. Or if you want slightly more like unicycle type uh, dynamics, then you can do kind of a local potential function, which is trying to capture that vector field in a potential function like, but just on that cell. It's not a global potential function, it's just a local potential function that sort of, if you say I want to go out, then it just gets me to that door and so on. And then you stitch potential functions like that. Okay, so effectively you take all the continuous people have to design controllers for each of these nodes, and then you plug these controllers in each of them. Okay, and then at the end of the day, what you get is the hybrid controller. Okay, it has both discrete and continuous uh, dynamics. And at the end of the day, you can sort of see that the hybrid controller will meet basically the temporal logic specification under some assumption. Okay, so the, um, the, uh, so the, the just, so the, so effectively what we have done is that somebody gives us the temporal logic specification, okay, this is uh, the, this reactive type of a specification which includes the environment, then you do a synthesis approach to get a planner, okay, and if the planner, if the temporal logic specification is synthesizable or realizable, then you will get the planner, otherwise you will get an empty strategy, it means that there's, the planner is not realizable, okay, if, if it is impossible. And then you design this hybrid controller by plugging in all these continuous vector fields inside the discrete modes, and you get a hybrid controller so that when you compose it with the, con with the robot, this composition is essentially bisimilar to the planner, and since bisimilation preserves LDL properties, if the planner satisfies this formula, then the continuous robot also satisfies the formula. Okay, this is essentially how you stitch all the pieces together. Okay, and uh, this is a top-down top view of the world. Okay, so uh, it's important to note that this is a top-down view of the world. It means that it's kind of a, a planning-friendly, control-unfriendly approach, meaning that the planner can just stick to the plan and see what they can do, and then it's really up to the controller to make sure that it implements whatever the planner wants, okay? And this will work in situations where the robot down here is not terribly constrained, okay? So if the dynamics are not terribly complicated and you can basically design these vector fields and, and the robot is sort of the omnidirectional and can move in all directions and so on, then that would be fine. If you're, if you're here, you have a, a very aggressive aerial vehicle, then designing those controllers will be much more challenging and in that case, you may have to start thinking about how to do this in a much more top, uh, bottom-up way where the control people say to the planning people, here's a list of 35 controllers that I have available for you. You plan with these 35 controllers because these are all I have. Don't ask me to do more than this. Okay? So this is very much a top-down view. And the, I guess the main result by stitching all these little things together is that if the formula is realizable, so if there is a planner that can be realized using this synthesis approach and continuous controllers exist so that you can sort of do this, then the closed loop hybrid control system satisfies the specification, but only of course if the environment is admissible, meaning only of course if the environment satisfies its assumptions. Okay? Again, since this is an implication, if the environment fails to do this, then you know, this formula is true regardless of what the robot does. Okay. So now let's look at some case studies here. Okay, so, uh, so the first one is the valet parking example. Okay, so here the problem is you want to drive around the environment, obey the traffic rules, meaning that you can see some of these things are stopping at stop signs and they turn red. And then uh, the specification for a robot is, you know, don't collide, follow the stop signs and so on. If you find a parking spot, park. If not, keep on searching forever. Okay, so the assumption could be for on the environment that eventually a parking spot becomes open. Okay, that's the assumption in the environment, so it's not a futile search for the car, and uh, so it keeps on uh, searching and, and so on. Okay, now in this case, because it is parking, orientation matters, and uh, therefore we cannot really stick to just, uni uh, just fully actuated robots, we really have to think about unicycles and how, how to do the parking controllers and so on. Okay, and you have to do those kind of controllers that satisfy the bisimulation property, but for unicycle style controllers and so on. 
Okay, this is a collaboration with David Connor, when he was doing his PhD at CMU, who was actually designing such controllers, and uh, other is in how we chose it. Okay, so, so essentially then, if you to summarize here, what we were able to show is that we could design such controllers for unicycle style robots that satisfy a very complicated specification, which is too large to write even on a slide. I just want to give you a sense a little bit of the complexity is that essentially we were, had a library of 300 plus controllers and more than 5,000 discrete modes. Okay, and because effectively we did never really mixed the discrete and the continuous together, we let the discrete side do the planning and then we let the continuous side implement the discrete thing. Uh, we were able to actually scale this up to something that is uh, uh, reasonable. Okay. Now we also apply this going back to the uh, urban challenge, which was a very similar thing, but far more complicated. It was 60 miles, lots of cars and so on, and a much bigger environment. Okay, so uh, in this case, uh, the environment, there was uh, two runs. There was a semi-final run, and then whoever could make it to the semi-final run could actually enter the final run. And the semi-final run looked like this. It was this sort of uh, circle, and then there was, uh, you could connect through here, and there were some parking destinations here. Okay, so the idea was drive around, don't crash with each other, go park occasionally, and so on. And if you could do all of this successfully experimentally, now this is of course all simulation, if you could do it experimentally, then, um, then you should take, you know, you could participate in the final exam. So this was uh, just at the level of complexity that we could handle with the existing tool technology out there and the, and the, and the controllers that we had, basically. Okay, so essentially you could have the, the, the robot here and then there would be either another car or some obstacle, a random obstacle that appears and then it stops and, and so on and, um, and it would go through the, the middle arc and so on. So, so this is trying to design effectively the logic of so how to stitch controllers together in a, some kind of a verifiable uh, way and, and synthesizable so that people don't have to write code and then do exhaustive tests of whether this would work well. So, so the semi-final under some simplifications could work. This is how the, the dynamics would be close to an interaction, uh, intersection point uh, and so on. Okay, so um, this is what I had on the reactive plan. If I guess I have like, you know, 10 minutes more and if, if uh, at most. So I want to say a few things about robustness, and I'm going to focus a little bit on the thesis of uh, Jurgis Finekos. Um, and this goes back uh, originally to the problem that no matter what model you put here, the control people will say, well, you know, it's not really a full, it's not really a unicycle, you have to include this or that, and it's never, you know, they're never happy. Or if you're happy with the model of your dynamics, this could very well be your real time implementation. Okay, so this. So whatever controller you design here, this was either, either life is more complicated or uh, you will implement it on some kind of a resource constrained computational environment and there's gonna be some discrepancy in the trajectories between the model and the real world and so on. So then the question is, you have just shown that you can, you can actually design controllers that prove this. The question is, does that mean that if, uh, if, the, if the real system actually does something different, slightly different, will we still get the guarantee? Okay. So how robust is our proof to slight perturbations of, on the physical world? Okay, that's essentially uh, what we um, talked, uh, we wanted to look at. And if you look at the, the sort of the way that people approach uh, connecting the, the physical, the continuous and the discrete world, there's a very discrete and Boolean view of the world. So, so if this is a trajectory of a robot and you ask, does this robot meet this temporal logic specification, this trajectory, then the answer would be you would do the previous work or you do other approaches and then you would say, yes, it meets the specification or no, it does not. And that's the Boolean view. But of course, the robot is not gonna do exactly that green thing. It's gonna do something close to it, right? It may do something like the red path. Okay, so not, not, not something that, that is, you know, it's something bounded, close to it, but, but not something exactly. Okay, so, so then the question is, if the green trajectory satisfies this formula, does this mean that the red trajectory also satisfies or not? 
Okay, how can we ensure? So what we came up with is sort of a, a framework which we call robust semantics of temporal logics. And the idea here is that the intuitive idea is that the semantics, given a trajectory and a formula, rather than saying that, yes, it satisfies the specification, or no, it doesn't satisfy the specification, you get a number. Okay, so, and this number is intuitively how thick this tube is around the trajectory that preserves the semantics, okay? So you wanna basically put as big of a tube around the green trajectory so that not only the green trajectory but any other trajectory in that tube also satisfies the specification, okay? Because there are many paths, there are many ways by you can say, if you say to a robot, go to room X, there are many paths that satisfy that. Some are more robust than others. So how can we select the more robust plants from the less robust plants? So that, that way you can give to the control or the implementation people more freedom to operate and do their stuff and incorporate the physical uncertainty, the computational uncertainty and so on. Okay, so that's, that's what we looked at. And um, so the intuition here is uh, how to have uh, the largest tube that preserves the semantics. And the key idea here, which again, I'm not gonna go through the the, the formalism is if you have a, a very simple proposition that says is x greater than four, then if uh, x is five, then, and then you ask is five greater than four, the answer would be yes. But in the, in the robust view world, if you ask whether uh, five is greater than four, you don't only get yes, which is a positive number, you also get how far you are from not satisfying. Okay, so in that sense, five is a more robust satisfaction of this proposition uh, than, than four. And, and the idea here is that if, for example, if X was four, then your robustness semantics would be zero, which means that any slight deviation would completely flip whether your plan is satisfies the formula or not. And those are the regions you really want to avoid. So if you, you want to be on robustly safe or the robustly unsafe region, what you really don't want to do is really be close to zero. So this now is a way that you can take this idea from atomic propositions and propagate it down by using standard uh, sort of approaches of how to define disjunction and, and conjunction and then how to do the temporal operators um, using this robust semantics. And this effectively gives you an algorithm. And this algorithm uh, computes not the robust given a tube, given a trajectory and the temporal formula, doesn't compute necessarily the largest cube, but an under approximation of it. Okay, so what you compute is an under approximation of this large, so if this is, if this is green and if this is what epsilon is, then it will compute something in between, and then you know that if the continuous world can stay within that cube, then your plan will still be safe. Okay, so if you go back to sort of an example we started at the beginning, is here are two plans, Here's two continuous executions, and this is the temporal logic specification. They both meet the formula. They both meet, meet the plan. So from the perspective of the symbolic discrete view world, they're both fine. All right. But this is a much more robust execution, meaning that any trajectory in these tubes will also satisfy the specification, whereas here you're barely touching this room and any slight deviation and you miss the plan. So you should somehow choose the, the execution on the left uh, rather than the right. And I think how to make plans more robust, not so much for, from the perspective of planning, but from the perspective of an interface to the people below you so that they can actually then say, so that then you can say, well, yes, this is a simple linear model, but there's nonlinear dynamics, but all these nonlinear dynamics can be bounded within this tube. Okay, that's essentially what you want to get at. And how to get uncertainty into planning so that, and uncert I really believe that uncertainty, uh, robustness will be a great interface across different uh, dis disciplines. So, um, so here's uh, the, actually a sort of a, a linear system and a more nonlinear system. And the, these are, the two dots are basically the discrepancy of the trajectories of the two models. This is the error between the two models. Okay, and you've designed a plan here, okay, and these are the trajectories of the two systems, but you have made sure 
that since the blue one was actually relatively robust with respect to satisfying the property, the discrepancy did not damage satisfying the plan at the lower levels and so on. Okay. So to summarize uh, the robustness argument, this is something that we are pursuing more going forward is essentially you've proven that this system satisfies the specification. Now there is a discrepancy here between the models and we capture it with a notion which we call uh, approximate by simulation. That's a, a talk for another day. And now what we want to know is that if there is a robustness uh, here that is delta, so if your, your robustness margin is delta, then if the discrepancy between the two models is epsilon, if the discrepancy between the two models is less than the robustness of your satisfaction, then whatever you've proven for the simple model will automatically propagate to the more complicated model. And that's how you can go. And this doesn't have to be a complicated uh, dynamics. It could be the real-time uh, embedded uh, computation and so on. So I just want to conclude uh, and say that there's a variety of tools that you can use to uh, explore these ideas. Uh, LTL MOP, uh, Hadass is uh, pursuing this uh, at uh, Cornell and this is, uh, and she also has plans to connect this to, our, to the ROS uh, platform for, with Willow Garage. Uh, PESOA is a tool that given nonlinear dynamics creates symbolic discrete abstractions that are not equivalent uh, in the sense of by simulation, they're actually approximately by similar. Okay, so they're within epsilon. So you can get sort of a symbolic abstraction that's within epsilon of the nonlinear system. Then there's uh, the LTL control, which does these controllers on triangles. And then uh, on the robustness uh, margins, uh, there's a tool called Talero from Arizona State, and it's actually being pursued also by NEC Labs. Uh, to use robustness, not so much in the case of robotics, but actually robustness in sort of numerical code verification. So the, one of the issues when you deal with numerics, when you have code, uh, that is how robust is the, your code that's computing Jacobians and so on. So uh, going forward, some of, some of the things that uh, I see people can do. Uh, of course, people hate writing temporal logic specifications or any other formal for specification. So ways by which you can have more informal, easily accessible, natural language potentially um, ways of mapping natural language to temporal logic would be very important. Of course, temporal logics are also very restricted. For example, in temporal logic, you, can, you, would you cannot say, and something you would like to say to a robot is, go between the two buildings and then make a left. So there's no between in temporal logic. Okay, so you need to enrich temporal logic to, includes, to include things like between and what, are, what is the semantics of between two regions and then it would be the convex hull of say between two regions and so on. So, so you need to enrich temporal logic to include things that when we direct robots to do things it would be very natural to say uh, things like that. And, and there's uh, a lot of work now happening in this space. Everything I presented today was offline. Uh, it was still a plan, so there was offline computation of a controller that you would then online monitor and, and see what the environment is doing and based on the actions of the environment you would do. There's also a need for more online ways of doing what I presented in the sense that uh, you can sort of build the planner on the fly, you can build the automaton on the fly, you can build the controllers as needed. You don't want to pre-compute the whole strategy for the whole environment uh, you may want to just keep on building that as contingencies arrive. Okay? And there's nice work by Fuk Toku and Richard Murray on how to do it in a more, doing this kind of problems, but in a more model predictive style of approach. And I think uh, more needs to be done here. Uh, this was purely deterministic. Uh, people have already gone probabilistic, both at the level of the logic as well as at the level of the dynamics. And I think something that needs to happen is clearly you have to do this uh, restriction here is we know the environment. We don't know the state of the environment. We don't know exactly where Nemo is, but we know the map that we're searching. So I think how to do these things in areas where we don't know the environment a priori and you can still say, well, go in this room and find and explore the environment and satisfy the formula, I think is a great problem. And of course, uh, you know, people, we, we use the binary sensor. Uh, so when you walk in the room and you see Nemo, uh, you have a sensor that says, yes, you saw an emo or no, you saw, and you talk to your vision people and they're, you know, very unhappy about that. Uh, and uh, so, so, you know, what they will say is, I am 95% uh, sure that this is an emo or not using my vision sensor. So, 
So then how do you incorporate that into this reasoning? Okay? Now, as I said already, that the approach today was very much top-down. So you start at the top and you keep on pressing and you, you, the layer below you is trying to implement the decisions of the layer above. If you go at the level where the dynamics are very complicated and you cannot design these controllers, then you may have to go more with a top bottom up view where, so for example, you have a 747, pilots have about 400 or 500 flight modes and, you know, and that's it. You know, so you have to really work with those controllers. You have a controller that does altitude control, you have another one that descends at a particular angle of attack. You know, these are complex dynamics. So you, they've been discretized, so you can choose basically what parameters and what mode, but you cannot say to them, well, my planner decided to do this, you now have to do that. But rather, they will offer you an abstraction and you have to plan with those abstractions. And I think much more needs to happen uh, there. And the final point is really that I really believe that hybrid systems control symbolic uh, approaches are very much about, on one side, mixing continuous and discrete, but perhaps more better is interfacing the continuous and the discrete. And I really believe that that community can offer opportunities for taking a lot of the great work that happens in this community and transfer that over to the continuous community. And on that note, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. I think it's, uh, I, I don't know if it is M squared and N cubed, depending on the sensor, uh, you know, so I think there's something I, I got. So uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, so I, I get that you see the interface between the continuous and the discrete side mm -hmm. as being perhaps the most promising mm -hmm. thing. But yesterday we had a lovely talk where uh, somebody was doing planning with models that actually um, contain the differential equations that described the dynamic system and then the planner was doing, uh, was reasoning directly with the, you know, complex dynamics of rotating systems and so on. And all of this was happening inside the planner, showing that planning can actually deal with very rich models that can mm -hmm. capture some of these mixed, discrete, continuous uh, behaviours. And I think there are those of us in the community who kind of hope that that integration, um, you know, might be a, a way forward as well. So you mentioned this bottom-up mm -hmm. kind of option, but I'd, I'd kind of like to hear a little bit more from you about that potential as opposed to this separation, which, which in some ways we've been doing in the planning community for a very long time, and we, we want to take the next step, I think. Yeah, so I've, uh, I've, I've, uh, you, this is the standard thing I hear from both the, uh, you know, so the, the, the planning community wants to go, thinks they can go all the way down, and the control community thinks they can go all the way up. <laughs> uh, so uh, I am not terribly, I mean, and, and, and I think that should be pursued. And whatever the state of the art is will determine where the interface ought to be. Uh, so I could think potentially of doing temporal logic in a potential fields way. Right? I'm going to construct this ter tremendous utility function that's going to do it, perhaps. And if that's the case, then we should make that an atom over which we then reasoning and planning and so on. Uh, right now, I see that the standard solutions, at least from the control side, are go from point A to point B, avoid obstacles. So the question then is how can we take that as an atomic primitive and reason with it to stitch, to do larger plans? Um, I think I, what I saw yesterday was um, there were planning issues, there were also control issues over time delays. And I think the control over time delays is in some sense a different uh, issue. So, uh, I'm, so my, my, my only comment to this is that I think people should pursue, control people should pursue to go as high up as they can. Planning people should pursue going down as low as they can. Uh, I see no problem with that uh, at all and I think uh, I, the only thing is I'm not optimistic that they can go all the way down or all the way up. I've seen that, that, that I, I'm not optimistic about that. So I think whatever the state of the art is, 
I think that will you know, define what the interface challenges are. And I think that's all I really have on that. Right. So, yeah. so I, I think we would certainly agree that you can't go all the way down or all the yeah. way up. But I think that maybe the interface is um, more mixed and more interesting than... Sure. Than yes. The, of course. Yeah. So if the temporal logic, for example, had timing behavior, right? If the temporal logic had timing behavior, then, then it would be more... Uh, it's, you know, it's just temporal logic. It didn't have any real time. It didn't have anything like that. So if you start including those things, which were part of the timing was, of course, an issue yesterday, then uh, you don't have to have, uh, you know, automata as the interface, which was today. It would be timed automata. Okay. And then there would be sort of, that would be a different interface. And, that, that, and that's fine. That's fine. I don't see any problem with that, personally. So thank you for your talk, and uh, I'm more interested in the synthesis that you do, that uh, is a game, you say, mm -hmm. and yes. uh, planning and game playing is quietly uh, related, and uh, I was wondering whether it is first that you get rid of, so, so you split the LTL formula in the environment and then in the robot and they play a game yes. and the both have LTL formulas so are, are there first the LTL formulas compiled it's one, it's one game you, you give the formula into the algorithm and you get one game yeah and then you it's uh, not a decentralized game if that's what you're asking yeah well there is this uh, general game playing thing oh. uh, and then the question is is uh, can we actually synthesize uh, your controllers with uh, those uh, yeah, game-playing uh, infrastructure uh, that is there. So is the LTL formula first compiled away with a synchronous product and then the game is played or is it in one go? So you it's, give one, it's one go, basically. It's, it's, it's really, yeah, so it's one go, really. It's not... Uh, if I understand the correct, the correctly the question, I think it's, it's just basically uh, you write essentially the, your temporal logic specification and then the algorithm plays essentially one game and at the end you get this one big automaton which the ro robot keeps and then uses that to go out and explore the environment. And that's so the functionality of the tool. Yes, 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 yes. Ah, hi, thank you for the talk. So I saw that uh, your uh, LTL formula is made of the propositions that define the states. So the controllers are basically transition between one class of states to another class of states, right? Yes. So, uh, but you don't have the notion of, an explicit notion of action at the propositional level, uh, the way that we do in planning. So that will be a way of uh, incorporating like the bottom up uh, direction of synthesis, like uh, if these controllers that, come, uh, that are designed by the control people could be abstracted in actions. So if you make these actions explicit at the propositional level, mm -hmm. maybe uh, you can mix the two, the two things, the, the bottom up and the top down approach. I mean, uh, so two, 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 two uh, aspects to your question. First, if you want to make the temporal logic more explicit to include the actions, and include or include specific oh. actions. I think that should be done, and you know, of course, there's temporal logic of actions and so on. And I think that should be done. Or, again, going back to the uh, bottom up meets uh, top down. The way that I see it happening basically is you can start top down, and you can construct these sort of uh, planners, and then you go to a particular level, and then you say, I would like you to realize basically this automaton. And then the control people, using their symbolic abstraction techniques, they can basically say, given the dynamics, here's a symbolic representation of the system. And then you take the intersection. They're both automata. You can take the intersection of the automata. If the intersection is empty, there's no way you can meet it. If the intersection is non-empty, then that gives you basically the, inter the, the sort of the planner that meets both the specification and the abstracted dynamics, which are executable at the end of the continuous level. The question, the, the challenge that we have seen on the discretization of the continuous world is you can just get enormously large symbolic abstractions, which are terribly useless. So the question then there is representational. What is the right level of a symbolic 
abstraction of the continuous system or the continuous properties, to be more precise. That, to me, remains still a challenge. For, not so much for the planning community, but for the control community, really, of how to present uh, coarser but implementable abstractions to planning layers. Because right now you can discretize by taking grids, which I don't like, and you will get large. And with the tools are, you can do it. But, but you're not being very smart at the continuous level by doing that. You're not exploiting the sort of the, uh, you know, the lots of tools and lots of ways by which you can sort of, so at the end of the day, we want to give coarser representations to the symbolic level that are executable below. By just discretizing and doing this kind of the standard approaches that I've seen with discrete abstractions, you're just going to hitting computational walls very quickly, basically. And, and I don't think that that's the way, the right way. I mean, I really think that the right way of representing continuous dynamics is very much the autopilot model. An autopilot, a pilot, it presses a button, says I want altitude regulation at 35,000 feet, and the controller then does it. There's no reason to discretize what the controller does. We know the controller will regulate under certain assumptions on the wind to 35,000 feet. Now you have, you, have, you have about 500 of these controllers and all the pilot does is really program the robot at that level of abstraction. The question is how can we do planning at that level? The control side is how can we offer abstractions at that level? And then the planning people would have to think about how to do planning with those type of abstractions. Uh, to me, that's where the interface is, but I have not really seen anything formal at that level yet. <laughs>